working with and studying the cattle market, both nationally and internationally now for over 30 years. So it really is a huge honor to have him with us this afternoon. I know he's really gonna be able to answer a lot of those questions that we have and really just help us get a full view on how the cattle industry is shifting and changing during this uncertain time. So without further ado, I will go ahead and pass it on to you, Dr. Peel. All righty, well, Aaron, thank you very much. Thanks to all of the uh, Extension folks in Tennessee for inviting me and for this opportunity. Thanks to everyone who's, uh, who is joining us this afternoon uh, for this uh, and to talk a little bit about these uh, uh, incredibly, uh, you know, unprecedented, pick any word you want. We've run out of superlatives to talk about how unique this situation is and how challenging uh, this situation is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of what we've been through to get here most uh, recently in the last couple of weeks. It's changing on a day by day basis, literally sometimes an hour by hour basis, uh, even more than cattle markets kind of always do. And so, uh, and I've titled this uh, protein markets, not just cattle markets. I'm going to quickly cover the other proteins for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, with this unique situation we're in, it's affecting all of the protein markets in somewhat similar ways uh, in many cases. So I want to give you a quick view of that. It's also affecting consumers because it is affecting all of the protein markets. And so to try to have a perspective on what's going on uh, from a consumer perspective, uh, we're going to quickly run through that. So, uh, so I've got several things here. I'll go through some stuff. Uh, to kind of show, uh, you know, sort of the big picture and then a little more closely to where we're in, at right now. And then I'm going to leave plenty of time for any questions or discussion that you have uh, a little bit later. I'm going to start off with uh, some work that I did or I headed up uh, with a uh, national team about a month ago. I was contacted and asked to put together a, a fairly quick study of the amount of damages estimated that the cattle industry in the U.S. had suffered as of early April, about a month ago, uh, and that was to provide input to USDA as a part of the process leading to uh, the programs that uh, Chris was talking about that, that will be coming out here. Uh, so we, uh, we did that, and just a quick overview, we estimated at that point in time uh, that, that the industry had suffered something like $13.6 billion in damages, uh, that included damages to the cow-calf sector, to the stocker sector, and to the cattle feeding sector. And so, uh, and, and we noted, obviously, that was in the middle of things, uh, that there would be more damages coming, and certainly that has been the case uh, since then. We were trying to estimate, you know, not just up to that point, but what we knew at that point about what was going to happen uh, through the rest of the year. But certainly, there's been some additional uh, things added to that. So, obviously, the industry is, is undergoing a lot of stress at virtually every level, and it's having a lot of impacts. Just a quick shot, I'm not gonna really spend much time on this, but these are uh, the reported uh, combined Tennessee auction uh, prices for three different weights of feeder cattle. Uh, just so you can sort of see what's happened since the first of the year uh, for your lightweight calves, for some six weight steers, and, and a little bit heavier, the 750 to 800 pound steers. You can kind of see, obviously we've had lots of volatility, uh, generally some pressure in these markets, especially on these, these heavier weight feeder cattle. So um, now to back up just a minute, I wanted to present, you know, kind of our current uh, estimates of beef production or meat production, really protein production in the U.S. Uh, so that middle column of all these numbers uh, is highlighted in yellow. Uh, and that really represents the most recent set of, uh, of projections. One of the things that's interesting out of everything that's happening, and we're going to talk a lot about the fact that we have some shortages happening, very real and, and pronounced shortages in protein supplies available and in the marketplace today. None of this has really changed our overall estimates of, of uh, meat production for the year. Beef production is still projected at uh, nearly 28 billion pounds, pork at nearly 29 billion pounds, broilers at about 46 billion pounds, and uh, and so all of those are at record levels. And again, we have not changed those overall. I don't think we probably will have to change them. What we are doing primarily is really radically changing the timing of these products coming to market here in the short run. And that's an important point because you're seeing lots of news today. Uh, for example, it was announced that Wendy's is having a hard time supplying enough ground beef to support their hamburger markets and their, and their restaurants. Um, those kinds of things are happening 
It doesn't mean, of course, that we have an overall shortage of meat. These are very temporary issues that we're gonna deal with here for the next few weeks. And, and that's what we're gonna talk about uh, mostly for the rest of this time. And then I'll have a few comments at the end about kind of where it looks like we're headed, headed next. Just as a reminder, because we've all had to learn a lot more about the food service industry or the, the food industry in the US over the last two months, so, you know, the, the food industry in the U.S. really consists of two major components. One is the food service side, uh, sometimes called HRI, which stands for Hotel, Restaurant, and Institutional Demand. Um, USDA data says that's about 54% of total food expenditures in the U.S. And so there's a very specific set of products that go through that, and they get there through a very specialized supply chain of uh, further processing, things that, uh, you know, industries or companies that do things like portion control, um, meat products for restaurants, there are specialized food distribution systems and packaging systems and those kind of things that supply that industry. 46% of our food expenditures go through retail grocery. And, uh, and of course, what happened a month ago, uh, really, in about mid-March, uh, was that a little more than six weeks ago now, I guess, uh, that uh, we basically closed down or largely closed down food service and we put all of the uh, emphasis on the retail grocery side. So, you know, all of the market is going through about half of the supply chain right now and has been for several weeks. That's created lots of uniquenesses. There's, there's a different product mix in some cases of products that go through retail grocery. And that also is a specialized supply chain that produces those case-ready products in retail packaging, the right size products for consumers, uh, the, the labeling that's required at that level. All of those things are specific to that level relative to the uh, food service sector. And so we've seen, um, you know, first and foremost, about a month ago in March, we were in, in mid-March, we started dealing with the fact that we largely closed down food service it dropped by somewhere in the range of 70 to 80 percent and at the same time we had a surge in demand on the on the grocery store side and so we saw shortages appear in grocery stores then simply because demand was outstripping the ability uh, to to get uh, you know all of the all of the demand if you will service through half of the supply chain and uh, at that retail grocery supply chain so we had lots of bottlenecks we're still dealing with those at this point in time, although we have, with a little more time, been able to, to overcome part of that. And in some cases, consumers are actually seeing some food service type packaged products even appear in grocery stores. Um, there had to be some special exemptions in some cases for labeling requirements and some other things to allow that to happen. Um, but we're still dealing with those. But then as we got into April, um, the, the, uh, the most recent uh, challenge in the industry has been the fact that COVID-19 now has impacted many of the communities where these packing plants are uh, across all of the proteins. So beef, pork, and poultry have all been impacted to various degrees. Um, and so we actually have the labor force impacted simultaneously across multiple plants. And that has led to uh, now very pronounced reductions in the ability to process animals and so, uh, you know, what was a bottleneck in March is now a, a, an actual reduction in the availability of, of uh, protein products in these markets. And so we're, we're right in the middle of that right now, very pronounced. I'll show you some, some graphs here in a minute that show just how severely uh, protein markets have been impacted. Uh, from a producer standpoint, what we have created then is, is very serious backlogs of market-ready animals be it cattle or hogs or uh, poultry as well. Um, and the way that those industries deal with those varies a little bit, but it's in, in all cases, uh, some very huge impact. So I'm gonna run through uh, broilers first, then a little bit on hogs. I'll do these pretty quickly. Our focus is on the cattle side. And then, uh, but, but I want you to see how similar in some way some of these impacts are. So broiler slaughter, you know, compared to what it was in the first quarter showed a really sharp downturn. Let's pick back up just a little bit. Um, and the broiler industry um, is, is impacted in slightly different ways, depending on uh, food service versus retail grocery. They also have the ability to adjust faster, and we'll see that uh, in just a minute. But you see that uh, fairly dramatic drop. Broiler production then comes from the slaughter. Uh, again, a sharp decrease from really where we were most of the first quarter over the last uh, four or five weeks. Um, 
the broiler industry can adjust quicker. And so what uh, one of the biggest adjustments we're seeing now is chicks placed. So the, the number of, of baby chicks entering these broiler uh, finishing houses has dropped dramatically. That's the industry's uh, way of, of uh, avoiding bottlenecks, if you will, by simply reducing the production of those broilers. Um, so that seven week finishing period roughly uh, that normally happens, uh, and you know, we're already three or four weeks into these reductions, which means that the industry will start a, a seeing that adjustment in production here and just the next uh, two to four weeks, uh, we'll begin to see the impacts of these decisions not to place as many uh, chicks in the houses. So the broiler industry is adjusting that way. There have been limited uh, euthanasia of uh, market ready birds uh, in a couple of locations, but by and large, the poultry industry has not had to do that. And uh, by making these adjustments, they probably will not uh, face a, as many of those, of those issues. If you look at prices uh, and overall bird price, composite bird price, you see the uh, dramatic drop. The broiler industry really heavily depends on that food service sector. So most of the broiler products have been pretty negatively impacted through March and April. Uh, some of it's again, is bouncing back a little bit. Uh, here's chicken breast prices, which were increasing seasonally and then abruptly fell off uh, in uh, mid to late March uh, and so on. Uh, chicken leg prices, again, dropped pretty dramatically, um, have recovered a little bit recently. Chicken wings, where do we eat wings? It's almost always in restaurants. And so you saw a very dramatic drop. They have come back a little bit, again, some adjustments. And so, you know, there's, there's some ability with some time to shift these products from a food service a supply chain. Uh, some of them perhaps are finding their way into retail grocery supply chains. We look at hogs, it starts to be even more dramatic. Hog slaughter in the last four weeks has dropped dramatically. So we've gone uh, four or five weeks ago from slaughtering about 2.8 million hogs a week uh, down to last week an estimate of just a little bit over 1.5 million uh, head of hogs. So very dramatic. Obviously that creates enormous backlogs of animals. Uh, the nature of the hog industry and the throughput of those uh, finishing facilities, really the entire production facilities, uh, means that uh, there's simply no place to hold those hogs. And so we have seen stories in the last week in particular of some euthanasia of hogs simply to avoid creating, um, you know, a domino effect, if you will, through the entire hog production sector uh, as a result of this. Pork production similarly dropping dramatically. And if you look at the, uh, the markets, uh, obviously on the live animal side, you've seen a sharp reduction in uh, and barrel and gilt prices over the last three or four weeks. Um, as a result of this, there's simply no demand for those animals, uh, or not all of them at least, at the, uh, uh, at the packing plants. Feeder pig prices are dropping. Again, that's the industry's ability or the industry's um, uh, mechanism for trying to uh, slow production ahead of time a little bit. If we go that long, um, it's, it's several more weeks, obviously, to finish these hogs. Um, but we're already seeing feeder pig prices drop dramatically uh, to try to, uh, to uh, adjust the whole production system relative to, to this situation. Cutout values dropped sharply in March and then have started to go up dramatically as a result of the production losses, the supply reductions that we're seeing now as a result of the, uh, the loss of processing capacity, packing capacity uh, in the industry. So ham prices, which were dropped dramatically in March and April, uh, now are starting to jump up. Loin prices, loins are one of the pork products that does well in grocery stores, very popular, uh, you know, be it whole tender loins or pork chops or whatever, uh, actually uh, went up and then came back down a little and are now shooting up dramatically on the basis of restricted supply of those uh, pork products in the grocery store. Pork bellies, uh, bacon, basically, Dropped uh, initially with the, uh, with the close down of the food service side. Bacon is popular in the grocery store, but in total, the uh, bulk of the demand really goes through the, the uh, food service side. And so you saw those decreases in pork belly prices. Now again, with the uh, lack of production starting to come up. Same thing for trimmings, which would be the basis for sausage products. And spare ribs, uh, which, you know, again, are popular in barbecue restaurants on the one hand. They're also a popular export item. 
dropped dramatically uh, with the uh, food service sector uh, restricted and then now um, reflecting the, the shortage. Okay, so with that said, we'll get to the cattle side. They're gonna look a lot like, in many cases, the pork uh, charts um, um, with some differences on some of the product prices, uh, which is you know interesting. It sort of reflects the supply chains. But cattle slaughter uh, has dropped dramatically. Uh, my estimation, and these are based off of the most recent two weeks are estimated slaughter. We get the actual data with a couple week delay. Uh, but we're so trying to watch what's going on right now. We're watching these daily estimated slaughter numbers. Uh, in the last four weeks ended last Saturday, um, we basically lost one week's worth of slaughter out of the last four weeks. So overall, it's about a 25%. Last week alone, it was about a 37 or 38% year over year decrease in cattle slaughter. And, and we probably would have been pretty close to those year ago levels um, perhaps slightly higher even uh, had we not been doing this. So the year-over-year -year comparisons are a pretty good indication of just how much we're not getting done right now. Uh, so we probably, uh, you know, we've certainly backed up, uh, um, you know, the, the, the week's worth of numbers is around 650, 660,000 uh, head of cattle uh, that didn't get slaughtered over the last four weeks. That would be both uh, cull animals, cows and bulls, as well as uh, as the yearling uh, steers and heifers fed cattle. Um, so we, we've already created a significant backlog in another two, three weeks that this may well continue. Um, we could have a very, very serious um, backlog of animals built up. And, uh, and uh, you know, how long will it take when these plants do come back online? They probably won't come back even to the capacity they had, uh, you know, early in the year pre-COVID. Uh, pre simply because we're gonna to continue to do things that uh, protect worker health. And so, uh, so the bottom line is we're probably gonna spend uh, quite a few weeks, if not much of the rest of the year, working through all of these issues. Um, now, I think the worst of the restrictions in cattle slaughter um, in terms of worker health and getting uh, workers healthy and back online may be in the next week or two but then the process after that to really see the recovery is, is gonna take several more weeks. And the process of working through the backlog of cattle will take many weeks, I think, at this point in time. So obviously, uh, you know, cattle prices, fed cattle prices have dropped dramatically. We've been below a dollar much of the time. The market's really disjointed right now. Um, you know, if you can get a pen of cattle accepted into a packing plant, the market is what it is. It varies quite a bit regionally now because it is kind of sporadic. Um, but the other side of it is there just is no market for a bunch of these cattle. And so uh, we're, you know, we're spending a lot of money to maintain these animals. I don't think the beef industry will get to a point where we would face euthanasia, but we are certainly incurring a lot of the additional expense to, to hold these animals in some sort of a maintenance way um, until such time as we can get them, get them processed. So. Now, one of the things that just as a little backdrop, the last, the last cattle on feed report we had in April showed that we did market a lot of cattle in March. Even before we recognized exactly how bad this was going to get, there were signals out there to move cattle ahead, and we did do that. That helped uh, to some extent uh, mitigate some of the backlog that we're seeing. Certainly, it's a big backlog, but it would have been worse had we not done what we did in, in March with, with marketings. Placements were low in March. Again, feeder cattle markets were already weak. Um, you know, it was kind of a, a mutual agreement. A lot of feeder cattle producers uh, didn't sell in March that probably would have otherwise. The markets were soft. Uh, and frankly, a fair amount of feedlots were already starting getting nervous about, uh, uh, you know, the potential that was coming down the road. And so they weren't terribly interested in placing cattle either. And so we didn't place too many cattle. We think April placements were equally uh, low on a year over year basis. And so we'll continue to see that. Now this cattle on feed number dropped dramatically as of April 1st uh, because of big marketings and low placements in, in March. Uh, the cattle on feed number will go back up obviously pretty dramatically in, uh, as of May 1st when we get the next cattle on feed report even though we didn't place very many cattle in April, but we haven't sold very many cattle. So marketings will be greatly restricted and uh, we'll see this cattle on feed number 
uh, build back up in a very dramatic fashion um, as we go through this. So this is a monthly number. That's usually pretty timely. Right now, a month ago might as well have been a year or five years ago, the way things are changing uh, in these markets. But it's still the backdrop that we're working in here. So beef production has been off again. Uh, beef production mirrors uh, cattle slaughter. We've lost about one week of the last four weeks worth of beef production. So there are now, compared to March, we have real shortages uh, in the near term of available supplies. Uh, again, you're seeing grocery stores restricting consumers. They're getting beef, but they're not getting anywhere near what they would like to have, what they normally would have. So they're telling consumers uh, not to surge in demand to, uh, to buy kind of a normal level of, of purchases and make the limited supplies go as far as they can. And again, we're starting to see even some restaurants, fast food restaurants in particular, uh, indicating some problems with, uh, with availability of ground beef in particular. Just as one more uh, negative thing, we don't need to spend much time on this, but on top of everything else, byproduct values are, are really weak right now. So that's another thing impacting uh, fed cattle values at this point. On the other hand, of course, these restrictions in supply are leading to tremendously uh, uh, record levels of box beef prices. Uh, this was the last weekly average last week. Uh, yesterday, I believe the, the choice box beef actually went up over $4 a pound. Um, and this leads to a lot of discussion about various things. One of the things that's important to remember is that uh, we only had about 60% of normal production last week. And so, um, and normally, uh, most of the, uh, that much of the product uh, in a packing plant would have been forward contracted, anywhere from one to six weeks ahead of time. So this price probably reflects a very small proportion of actually available negotiated trade uh, last week. And so you're seeing these dramatic increases in, in cutout values. Um, obviously, uh, Grocery stores in particular are scrambling and we're beginning to see some food service come back online. So there's some demand there as they're starting to ramp up, even if they're not gonna open for a week or two, they gotta order product. And so, uh, so we're starting to see a, a lot of scrambling for a very, very limited available of supply of meat, um, not only because we're producing less, but also again, in the normal course of business, a lot of that meat would have already been uh, contracted ahead of time. So, um, so we're seeing these just phenomenal increases in cutout values. If you look at uh, specific cuts, uh, or at the wholesale level at least, you know, chuck prices from the very beginning just went through the roof. Chuck and round, and the charts look fairly similar, uh, are both products that are very popular in grocery stores, primarily for ground beef, but also for certain kinds of uh, and sort of value-based, um, you know, muscle cuts. Um, and so chuck and round prices have just been extraordinary from the very beginning in mid-March when we uh, basically uh, closed down the food service side and shoved everything into the retail grocery space. Um, and so you see that. On the other hand, uh, it's a little different story when you look at the middle meats. Uh, the initial reaction in March uh, of a ribeye, for example, was a weakness in prices because Ribeyes are something that are sold in grocery stores. They're probably more heavily sold in restaurants typically. So you saw some initial weakness. And then again, of course, now there just isn't much of the product and the prices are jumping up. Tenderloins were even more dramatic. Um, tenderloins are almost entirely a uh, restaurant-based menu item. And so those prices were quite weak through March and April uh, until uh, just in the last week or two with the uh, with the limited supply. And again, restaurants are beginning to open up, probably means they're placing orders in anticipation, even if they're not open yet. Uh, they're probably planning to open sometime in the next uh, couple to four weeks. And, and so they're, they're beginning to place uh, orders for this product. Strip loins is kind of an intermediate state. It's a very popular grilling item. It's really come the closest to not being affected by this. It's really followed a fairly normal seasonal pattern. Uh, we normally see a lot of buildup in these prices as grocery stores get ready for grilling season ahead of Memorial Day. Uh, they've done that. They're going a little bit higher now because of the limited supply, um, but uh, kind, of a, kind of unique amongst all of the meat items in that this one has behaved as, as close to normal as any, as any product you can, you can find at this point. 
you look at the uh, trimmings market where we get ground beef on the institutional or the restaurant side, the food service side, um, you know, 90% lean, uh, dropped in March. Uh, again, food service demand a little bit, and then it's come back up since then. Even more dramatic is the 50% trimmings market. So normally our fed cattle produce all of these 50% trimmings. We mix lean from cull cows or from imported product or wherever to turn that into ground beef. Most of that type of ground beef production is, is for fast food restaurants primarily. Um, and so that demand got really weak. And initially uh, back in late March, we saw these 50% uh, lean trimmings prices drop down just below 30 cents a pound at the same time, if you remember those Chuck and Round charts, uh, we're just going through the roof. And to a large extent, both of them are used to make ground beef, but one of them is on the food service supply chain, this one here, the other one is on the grocery store supply chain. And so uh, now with a little bit of time, there will be arbitrage between those markets. So that's part of what started bringing these 50% trimmings. Now I'm sure some of that product is finding its way to grocery stores now. And then, of course, aggravated by the reduction in supply, um, resulting from reduced uh, slaughter in the last uh, three or four weeks. So we've seen just tremendous uh, dynamics in these markets um, uh, and so on as, as we go forward. So what's next after all of that? Um, and, you know, I'll be obvious, uh, uh, you know, very honest. I've got more questions than answers like everybody else. But... You know, I think you can think about several different phases here. Um, I'm gonna say the next month mostly is gonna be, uh, again, trying to work our way through the current situation that we're in uh, with, the, uh, with the packing plants uh, severely reduced in capacity. They're either closed or operating at uh, way less than, than full capacity. Um, I, I don't know how long that's gonna take, but I really think over the next uh, week to two weeks, we'll see it sort of reach its apex. If we're not already there, we could be. Uh, and then we'll start in the, in the couple weeks after that, uh, begin to get uh, a more healthy workforce back in these plants and start to bring them back up to uh, something closer to normal capacity. Again, I don't think we go back to pre-COVID capacity, perhaps ever because we're just gonna do things differently, I think, from now on, uh, in terms of trying to provide uh, more distancing and, and so on uh, in those packing plants. At the same time, we're gonna see more and more, it looks like at this point, bringing the food service sector back online. Uh, from a demand standpoint, that's gonna add additional demand, which, which may mean more challenges in the short run with the, the supply limitations that we have, Longer term, of course, that's a key to uh, getting beef demand overall back up to uh, more typical levels in terms of the domestic demand component of our, of our industry. So certainly as we think ahead beyond the next month uh, and, and towards the, the middle and second half of the year, uh, all of those things will be important to that. This period, of, I've got it labeled here two to eight months, uh, probably has the biggest question marks for me. That's the time period in there where I really don't know, um, you know, um, a number of things. One is uh, once we get the packing plants working, we've got this tremendous backlog of fed cattle that we're gonna have to work through. That's gonna take, uh, again, quite a, quite a long time, I think. So we'll be dealing with that on the supply side, if you will, and that's certainly gonna play a lot into uh, our, our uh, you know, fed and feeder cattle markets. Now, once we start moving those fed cattle, uh, then we'll see some relief on the feeder cattle markets um, just because feedlots will then be able to start placing cattle and, and so on, even if they've got quite a backlog of fed cattle that they're, they're still working through. But once we can sort of see movement and things, uh, that'll help a lot. The other thing that's gonna happen once we kind of get the country past the worst of the uh, COVID-19 health issues, hopefully uh, in the next few weeks uh, or a couple months or whatever it is, then we're gonna really uh, focus our attention on the recession that we're in. Uh, we're clearly in one. Um, we won't pronounce it officially for some time, but we're in one. We've got massive unemployment in the short run. And the question is, how long uh, will that last? How long, how quickly can we rebuild these things uh, and come around? Um, you know, the best you could hope for would be something in the second half or towards the end of the year. Um, and, and it's just unknown. It could happen that fast, but it could also take uh, quite a bit longer than that. 
On top of that, we realistically have a global recession. Uh, and so we're going to go back at some point and talk about uh, the bigger picture trade issues, those kind of things. Um, there is, you know, on the one hand, some positive news there. There's still a global protein deficit that results really from China and the pork industry issues they've had. Uh, on the other hand, China and every other country just about has seen significant economic uh, impacts of COVID-19. And so, uh, you know, the overall prospects are certainly less now than they would have been uh, before all this started uh, when we looked at it from the perspective of the beginning of the year. Um, but it does still have a lot of potential as we go forward. So all of those are unknowns uh, as we go forward. Um, and then, you know, long term, I, I think we're probably going to talk about some permanent changes in this industry or in this country, really, and in, in, in terms of a lot of things. Um, you know, uh, and these are not things we're probably going to worry too much about right now, but there are some interesting uh, potential here long term. Uh, I'm not sure we ever go back and do travel the way we have in the past. Uh, so travel industry, you know, business travel, we've all learned how to do Zoom. And so I suspect we're going to do a lot of Zoom meetings from now on rather than some of the kinds of travel things that we would have done in the past. Uh, some of those kind of things. We've all, uh, many people have had to learn how to cook or had to, to sharpen their cooking skills at home. Uh, what kinds of long-term impacts does that have on uh, the uh, food service versus uh, retail grocery uh, uh, side of these markets and, and how will those work longer term? So, you know, again, lots of issues going forward. Uh, the next month uh, to two months will be through very clear challenges. Uh, just getting out of the logistical and, and physical impacts that we're seeing on the market right now. And then we'll start to deal more fundamentally with those economic issues uh, that are out there. So that said, I'm going to put that up. This is how you get a hold of me if you want to. Uh, that's my email. So you're welcome to that. This information is available. If you want it, you can either email me or you can get a hold of one of these extension folks and they can let me know. I can, I'm sure happy to share this. I do write a weekly newsletter. If you're interested in that, I don't sell anything. I just put out information that uh, my, uh, my usual caveat is that it's free unless you believe everything I say, in which case it could get expensive, but uh, with a little luck, not too much of that. So that said, how are we doing on time? We got time here for some questions. I'm actually gonna go ahead and stop sharing unless there's a reason not.